Sam, how are we? I'm very well. I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. No, it's great to have you on. I have been following you on Instagram for, I'd say, a couple of months now, and I've been enjoying your content, I guess, how this has come about. Uh, I commented a couple of weeks ago on one of the videos that you put up of you sitting eating some steak and eggs and I think the comment that I put up was something along the lines of natural steroids and then like a flex emoji um, but I had ceased to think that you probably get accused of taking steroids all the time because of the way your body looks um, but of course I know that you haven't and I guess what I meant by the comment was that you uh, you know when you eat steak and eggs you grow muscle and uh, that's something that I do a lot as well so yeah it's been a uh, it's been great to see your content to, to follow what you're doing but i guess my first question is 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 that something that you get accused of a lot i do i do i mean i've gone through stages of you know just accepting it and just like taking it as a compliment to where sometimes when people really accuse you of lying like like they really say oh you're lying you must be taking it i kind of do get offended sometimes because I feel that I don't get enough credit. I know that sounds a bit strange, but I've been training for over 20 years. I'm a two-time British champion. So it's like when people accuse me, and I'm not saying it's cheating, you know, I've got nothing against people taking steroids at all. But these people accuse me without even knowing anything about me. You know, they don't know about my history. They don't know, like, it's just silly things. Like my dad, for example, and I won't go too much into it, but my dad is pretty jacked. And he doesn't even lift weights. So people don't understand about genetics, about training history, how consistent I've been. They just see a big guy and just automatically think he's on steroids. Yeah. It's yeah. just is what it is. You know, obviously we will get into, you know, my social media blowing up, but obviously I'm going to get more of it, right? I'm going to get more of people <laughs> looking at me straight away and just jump into conclusions and saying he's on steroids. He's promoting this food and basically saying, like the kid, like the liver king, if you eat this, you get big, which is not my message, but it is yeah, what it is. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. He got caught red-handed, as we know. But, uh, you know, I think there's a there, there's a definite, like, look. Uh, I think when you uh, spend a bit of time, you know, looking at people who train a lot or people who have been athletes or whatever, that, you know, with a lot of years in the gym when they're, you know, training and lifting weights consistently that you can get to. And there's there's obviously a, a look that is not that. And I think you can begin to differentiate between what is steroid use and what's not. And like even, you know, I, and hence the fact that I made that comment because I didn't even think for one minute that you would have taken yeah. steroids. So it shows yeah, the, yeah. I guess it shows the innocence and in, in where I was coming from. Um, but yeah, give us like, I think let's start with a, uh, Give us a little bit on your background. I know a bit about you, uh, obviously, some of your YouTube stuff and on Instagram, I've uh, been following you there. But yeah, give us a little uh, brief uh, into who you are and what you do. Okay. So first and foremost, you know, I like to say that I'm a dad. You know, I've got two young girls, five and six. Um, proud dad, you know, they're a big, obviously a big part of my life. And I think, you know, a lot of what I do is for them. I think a lot of people do say that it's for their family and kids. But, you know, I spend a lot of time with my kids. Um, I pride myself being a, a good dad. So that's first and foremost who I am. I like to say I'm a dad. Secondly, you know, I'm an online coach. So I help people getting in shape. I help people with their mindsets getting in shape. So I'm kind of a, a mind and body transformation coach. Everything is online. So I've never really done one-to-one -one personal training. And I'm a two-time British natural bodybuilding champion. So I won my first British title in 2014, and I won my second in 2016. And then I retired unbeaten. So <laughs> I've actually never lost a bodybuilding show. I have to put that out there just, just for my ego. <laughs> um, kind of retired, no, not losing, because if I, if I lost, I'd probably be devastated. And yeah, you know, now I'm really kind of pushing my social media. I've been on social media since 2014, 10 years. And I've kind of seen that a lot of people do struggle with nutrition. You know, it's always the, the thing that people come to me for, you know. They all say, you know, I'm good at the training side of it. You know, I can get to the gym, but I always struggle with diet. So for me, you know, it's just something that I've been really, really interested in for years and years and years. Like I've always said that 
I'm not an expert when it comes to training, but I pride myself on knowing a lot about nutrition. And over the last two months, I've really started to show what I eat and how I eat and try to simplify it. You know, with the fitness industry these days, there's so many different strategies and ways to lose weight and it can get confusing and overwhelming. For me, all I'm just trying to teach is eat healthy foods, single Mm. ingredient foods and cut out the processed foods, which a lot of people do know. But people sometimes want to see a sexy way of um, of doing it or a kind of a shortcut or a secret when, you know, unfortunately there is no secrets. It just comes down to, you know, good quality nutrition and hard training to build muscle or lose fat. But the way I'm kind of sharing it is kind of a bit out there. It seems a bit extreme, you know, because I've got my top off all the time. I'm eating on the chopping board, which is weird for a lot of people, but it does attract attention. And builds engagement and obviously that's what's helped me grow over the last well it's not even been two months I think it's been a month and a half less than that that I've grown from 16,000 followers which you know was a decent amount at the start that I've built up over the years to now I'm at 57,000 so I've gained 40,000 followers in the last month and a half just through you know sharing what I'm eating and, and trying to give knowledge as well I'm not just kind of telling people that this is what I eat I'm trying to educate people on, you know, why I eat the way I eat. And it's mm-hmm. not just about what you eat, it's how much you eat, which you probably see a lot of the fitness industry talking about calorie deficit and, you know, all these types of things. And I'm all for that. You know, I'm a big advocate of counting calories because I don't believe that you can just eat healthy foods and get in shape because, you know, the reality is it's the law of thermodynamics. Like you have to burn more calories than you consume to lose weight but some people don't like to hear that you know so you're always going to get different camps and you're never going to please everyone and this is where i'm at right now where i'm i'm getting a lot of haters i'm getting a lot of people that love it but i believe that my message is right for most people and if people don't like it then they just have to hate and then help my engagement i suppose yeah yeah i think that's how i came across you so like my Instagram algorithm is, uh, or definitely on the explore page, is sort of filled with, uh, you know, meat, uh, steak, eggs, carnivore-ish type eaters and coaches and stuff like that. I guess like over the last probably year and a half, it's been something that I've tried to do and been like conscious of is trying to like up my intake of red meat. Uh, I've seen a lot of benefits off the back of doing that, obviously with the nutrient uh, nutrient density of red meat, um, you know, just things like I'm not getting cold, I'm not getting these little like bugs and flus that go around as much as I used to. Um, so yeah, it's been it's, it's been really cool following you, and I think like certainly over the last like three months for me, I've really tried to narrow down my focus on on what I'm putting in my body and and how I'm training, um, and really essentially over over the last month, and it's something that we can talk more about today. Because I've sort of been focused on more uh, just really eating meat, um, sort of carnivore style, Uh, a lot of red meat, you know, some bacon, eggs, um, other types of meat occasionally, like lamb and stuff like that. Uh, And I guess over the last month, started to like integrate a little bit more, uh, you know, like yogurt, a little bit of dairy, uh, even some fruit and that type of thing. So, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm starting to really... uh, I guess becoming more focused in on this way of eating, I'm starting to become conscious of the calorie count type thing, which is interesting you speak about that because I know now, you know, I've got a goal in my mind of what I want to achieve, but at the same time, I know I'm probably not going to get there unless I take it to the next level, which is actually focusing more on the calories and that type of thing. But anyway, let's, we, we can speak all about that as we get into this, but yeah, I guess like, you know, going back to the start, uh, bodybuilding seemed like it was a big focus of, of you and what you did. Like, how the hell did you get into that? So funny story, when I was younger, my stepdad um, gave me some some dumbbells at home and uh, I was literally 13 at the time and I was lifting them in my bedroom of a night time, religiously. It was just like a strange routine that I had with no awareness of how it was going to affect me. I didn't really understand about building muscle or anything like that at that age. It was just a very strange kind of habit that I built. And I kind of contribute that to my, my biceps. I used to do like curls at nighttime for like 30 minutes every night, <laughs> just literally just curls. 
just dumbbell curls, like just repetitions, repetitions. Um, so yeah, like it was just for the love of just enjoying it. And I think a lot of people that you see now that have got really good physiques are doing it for the enjoyment, not necessarily to get the result. And I, I suppose that's like everything in life, right? If you if you enjoy it, you're going to get better results. So for me, it, it started from there, you know, just lifting weights uh, for fun. And then obviously I started to develop a, a, a bit of a physique into my teens. I got a little bit naive and I kind of thought that, you know, when I first stepped into the gym, everyone would be looking at me and thinking, wow, look at this, look at this guy, he's got so much potential. And I was actually right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I went into my <laughs> first gym, which was like a leisure center and people were looking at me thinking, wow, like this, this young kid's got uh, some decent muscle. Um, and then my first gym was kind of like an old school spit and sawdust type gym where a lot of the people in there were steroid users. So for me, that helped push me um, kind of like try to keep up with them because I knew that I was progressing at a good rate and I didn't need steroids because I was gaining muscle pretty quick. So I took to it very well and it wasn't until around 2012, I think, when the guy started saying, look, maybe you should just start doing like a bodybuilding competition. And for me, I've always had a competitive streak. I've always wanted to to win at absolutely everything. I was pretty good at sports. When I was younger, I played every single sport. I was kind of one of those kids that was good at everything. Uh, and I, I was a bit ego driven, but I was, I'm not going to say I was naturally gifted. I just mm -hmm. took a, a love or a liking to just doing all sports. So I played football very well. I played everything. Um, so you can kind of say that I had that athlete base at the start, but I, you know, bodybuilding is the thing that I really pursued. So I went to do a bodybuilding competition. So I hired a coach in 2012, uh, a natural uh, guy. His name was Peter Chaum. And he was like, you know, Mr. Universe um, in the natural bodybuilding scene. And I hired him and I got to a point where I was like, I don't know, eight weeks out. And I said to myself, I'm just not ready. You know, I'm not ready. I'm not confident in the way I look. You know, and I just said, I'm not going to do it. So I gave it another two years I hired another coach in 2014 and then I thought I was ready. I was like, I looked to myself and, you know, people around me was like, you're going to smash this. And, you know, naive, not naively, but I had the confidence, you know, I had the confidence because I've been putting in the work. I'd already been training for like, um, 10 years. So around 2016 to two, uh, two, 2000 and 2016 years old, sorry, to when I was 26. So 26 was when I'd done the first show. And yeah, I, I won the regional area. So the Southeast, I won the lightweight title and the novice title. And then I went on to the British championships and I won that. And that's where it all kind of picked up for me in terms of like personal training and coaching. Um, I had the confidence in myself and the knowledge that I'd built. Um, but funny story, I... I um, I applied to become a personal trainer in 2013. So that's when I qualified as a personal trainer, but I just didn't have the confidence to, to pursue it as a business. I was, I just didn't, I just really didn't feel like I had the knowledge. And, um, around 2015, I went to a, a couple of, you know, big commercial gyms, David Lloyd and Virgin Active to become a personal trainer. And I, and I got a knock back, you know, it just wasn't the right fit for them for whatever reason, even though I'd had this, kind of British title in 2014. So it was in 2016 when I just, I was working as a delivery driver at the time. So for me, it wasn't a great job. I wasn't happy. It was kind of, I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I knew that I had potential to do more, especially with, you know, the British title that I'd won and the knowledge that I'd built. Um, so in 2016, I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. So I quit my job with, five clients I had at the time so five online clients and um, I had a mortgage and I had a lot of pressure but I thought you know if I don't take this leap then I'm just forever just going to be waiting until you know I build up that client base to replace my income which a lot of people do and then my partner told me that we're there's we're having a baby and I was like wow okay I've really got to step this up now 
So yeah, I pushed it and kind of that was the pressure that I needed to kind of really, you know, build everything. And then from there, you know, I just put the work in. I put the work in, tried to get the message out, really push social media and build my business to a point where, you know, I'm coaching a lot of people now. I'm very satisfied with, you know, the results that I get. Because I pride myself on, you know, really helping people get transformations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've jumped a bit there. You know, 2016, I also competed again. I won another British title. But I got to the point where I was like, right, I've, done, I've got two British titles now. What's next? You know, a world title. I, I don't think a world title is going to actually make any difference to my business. You know, I really mm-hmm. wanted to help my clients and and selfishly bodybuilding is kind of all about you isn't it it's like it's a 24 7 job you could say so it helped me get to where i wanted to get to which was helping clients and giving them my knowledge that i'd built and inspiring them from what i've achieved but i just felt like winning more titles would just be for my ego and as much as it was hard because it, i felt that was my identity you know i really kind of prided myself on just becoming the best coach i could be mm-hmm Brilliant, man. And so there's a few things that you've said there that I guess I've kind of sprung this question into my own head. And that's like, you know, as a young guy, um, how would you like describe yourself? Because like I know when it comes to bodybuilding, like it is probably the most disciplined sport. If you want to like achieve anything and win, then you have to be extremely disciplined. And I think like for a lot of people, it might take a little bit longer, a little bit more time in life to get to a point where they actually are disciplined. Um, I know you've obviously mentioned uh, how important it is being a dad um, and, and other sort of things, but like morally as a young guy, like if you can like explain or, or shed a little bit of a light on what type of person you were, I'm sure it's changed dramatically as to where you are now, but who, what were you like as a young guy? What were the things that were important to you? I think um, just getting respect. I think a lot of guys want respect. You know, mm-hmm. you know, people they, they want to be recognized for the hard work they're putting in. And I think with bodybuilding, you know, building a physique, which is one of the hardest things you can do, you know, it's like the top 1% because it's very hard to gain shape, but bodybuilding is extreme. So it's, it's a mental challenge more than it is physical. You know, you've got to refrain from eating the foods that you want. You've got to put the work in. You know, it's a lot and, you know, it takes its toll. It's a very, very time-consuming, very dedicated um, sport that I don't believe people get enough recognition for. But it helps me, you know, build that discipline that I needed. You know, you learn about patience. You learn about, you know, work ethic. So I kind of pursued it naturally because I had, I don't like talent. I don't like it when people say talent because I don't really believe in talent. I believe in hard work because you don't just naturally become a, a good bodybuilder. I mean, you've got genetics, you know, and I always say, you know, I'm not going to take away. I've got good genetics, mm. not in the calf department, because if you saw my <laughs> calves, they I don't even want to, I never even like to show them to be honest. I don't wear shorts a lot. <laughs> my biceps are big and that's due to genetics and obviously training for a long period of time. But, you know, for me, it was just, I love the competitive side of it. You know, I love winning. I absolutely hate losing. I'm a very sore loser. And um, had that natural kind of genetic structure, you could say. Um, and I just thrived on doing something that not a lot of people could do. You know, I thrived on doing something that wasn't normal. The amount of times that people would say to me, like, why can't you just be normal? And, you know, I think Arnie's got a good quote, isn't it? It's like, you know, why be normal? Like, it's just average is is boring you know you want to be someone that stands out and i think this is why a lot of people look up to arnold solskjaer because you know what he achieved in under his circumstances is is remarkable so for me you know bodybuilding was something that i had to do to make me feel like a little bit worthy and a lot of people go into bodybuilding because they've got low self-esteem and i admit i did have very low self-esteem when i was younger so it's kind of like an outlet and it's kind of something that I used to make me feel like I was important. But then you realize after that, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Like you've just got to be true to yourself. And if people don't like you, then it is what it is. And this is what I'm learning right now. You know, with my social media, as I'm building it, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a lot of people that don't like what I do. But as long as I'm true and authentic to myself, then that's the most important thing. Yeah, no, I totally relate to that. You know, me, 
you know, going into sort of my backstory, I, I was a professional rugby player for years and, you know, the thing that I wanted most out of anything as a young guy, looking back to 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, it is respect. That is actually the sort of thing that is at the pinnacle of ev everything that is moving forward in a direction it's because of respect. And I think uh, it's probably a healthy thing. And I think it's just the stage that the ego's at at that point, isn't it? It's trying to find yeah. out who it is. We're trying to discover what's important to us. And, um, you know, for me, it was like, well, I can remember watching rugby on the TV. I think it was at like the 2007 World Cup or something. I remember seeing I think it was France v England, I think the game was. And, you know, the way that the players were diving around, it was almost like warrior-like. And I, I looked at that and that just inspired me. I was like, imagine yeah. representing your country or playing that game professionally where you had to turn up and, and show up like every game without fear. Yeah. And that was something that I think inspired me. And I thought, you know, if I can get that, then I'll be respected. That that was exactly. it. And I, and I also agree with what you say there about like a lot of people, I think that um, maybe go into bodybuilding. I'd probably extend that to maybe sport in general, probably yeah. have quite low self-esteem. I was similar to you in a lot of senses that naturally I, I was probably quite gifted with genetics six foot four i was pretty athletic you know i could pick up skills quite quickly i was skinny as fucking tall well up until i was about 16 17 then i got into the gym and started to bulking up and that happened pretty quickly but yeah i mean those um to be able to reflect on some of those things and you know the way that you per perceived yourself and what was important to you back then versus now uh, I guess it is a, a, a signal to the to the the journey and the length or distance that I guess you've come as an individual, and you know I think about that often as well. So, well, that's cool. Like, um, I guess like now, I want to touch on like what what's your training like? Like, what what do you do in a, in in a week? Like, what's your training makeup? We'll speak about diet in a bit, but just in terms of lifting, what what are you doing? Yeah. So with my training, you know, it has changed over the years. You know, I used to be that typical bodybuilder that would do, you know, the five, six days per week. You know, I've, I've gone, I've done various different training methods, but it's mainly been kind of bodybuilding style, you know. But over the last few years, I've got into jujitsu. So for me, that was just kind of something that I had to, to do to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. You get comfortable sometimes when you're training and you're, you're competing and you're doing certain things. So for me, you know, jiu-jitsu was, I mean, I was planning to compete in jiu-jitsu. That's changed a little bit now. But, you know, I, was, I only started that three years ago. And again, it's one of those things, naively, I jumped into it thinking I would be good. I mean, I was pretty good. <laughs> but jiu-jitsu is one of those things where, you know, it doesn't matter how big you are, how strong you are, you can get folded up by someone a lot smaller when it comes to jiu-jitsu. So that was definitely an eye opener but I'm loving it you know I don't you know last couple of weeks I haven't been going as much as what I should but I'm a blue belt now so um, I've been a blue belt for a year and a half and I'm enjoying it I'm enjoying the journey you know and again it's it's like everything if you're not enjoying the journey you're just doing it for achievements then you're not really going to be consistent and you're not going to get the satisfaction so my training has changed a lot so it's gone from the typical bodybuilding style training to more of a you could call it a hybrid training style where i'm focusing a little bit more on strength um you know i'm still one of these people that i don't over complicate my training and, and this is what i see a lot of people do is over complicate it because at the end of the day you have to get super clear on why you're doing these certain methods you know is it to build strength is it to build fitness is it to build muscle so for me because i'm doing jiu-jitsu now i don't need to be building tons of muscle i mean i'm happy with i mean everyone wants more but, you know, I'm satisfied, I kind of think I am, with the amount of muscle that I've got, you know, and being natural, is there much more I can build? Who knows, as I'm getting older. So it's just more about just managing recovery, building strength, building my fitness and improving my jiu-jitsu. So it changes, you know, depending on how I feel. I might do three to four weight training sessions per week, uh, focusing on strength and a little bit of hypertrophy. And then we've got, you know, a few cardio sessions here and there. I might do some hit training. I might do some stuff on my assault bike, which I don't really like doing. If you if you've obviously been on the assault bike before, they're actually they're just brutal, aren't they? And then you've got your jujitsu sessions, which, you know, when I'm having a good week, you're looking at four to five sessions on a bad week, it's like one to two. So yeah, for me, it's more like improving on that, you know, because you know, weight training can get boring if you're if you're not if you haven't got a goal. 
Mm -hmm. right? So you've always got to set those goals to push you. And for me, it's about getting better at jiu-jitsu. And down the line, I might compete. But it's one of those things. If the ego's in the way, it's like, I don't want to lose. I actually was going to compete as a white belt um, right at the very end. I wanted to make sure I was the best white belt I could be. But then I got promoted to blue belt. So I was like, right, I'm going to wait another two years. <laughs> but um, yeah. Class. And so like, see when you're doing your sort of three to four strength training sessions a week, like, are you focusing on upper body? Is it a split between legs and upper body? Is it on different days? How's the makeup? I'll be honest with you. I've got no real structure to it. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of your upper lower style workouts for me, just for preference. You know, there's a lot of people out there that will say, you know, full body, upper workouts, lower workouts, hitting multiple body parts per week is is the best. But what is the best? You know, everyone is individual. You know, there's no such thing as optimal unless it's 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 individual. You know, and this is what I pride myself on when it comes to coaching is making sure that it's tailored towards you, not to what I think is best. Because it's all about being consistent. I know you hear that a lot, you know. But for me... I do like your, you know, your bro splits. You know, I, I do like just going in and hitting chest on its own and back on its own. So it's really, it comes down to how I feel, but I am a huge, huge advocate in, you know, progressive overload, so getting stronger. So I try not to change it too much, but I always keep similar lifts in so I can progress. Um, because, you know, that's obviously one of the most important things when it comes to building muscle. If you're just changing your training plan, you know, every week to shock the muscle, then you're really not going to progress and you're not really going to build muscle. So I like to just make sure that I'm keeping in a lot of the same lifts and then I'll just change the frequency a little bit. And yeah, you know, it, it's more like a, a push-pull leg style um, split. Although legs, I've been uh, a little bit lazy with legs. It's one of those things. It's like, I was I had to train legs for bodybuilding. I don't have to train legs now because I don't really care what they look like. But obviously, if I want to really kind of improve my jiu-jitsu, then strengthening your legs is going to be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. Like, the first thing that gets neglected in my training program is always legs. For years, 12-year rugby career, I had to lift legs. If I didn't do legs, you know, I was going to get injured. It'd be a hamstring that yeah. was gone or a quad tear. So, yeah, nowadays, it, it tends to be more upper body. And that's what I enjoy working out because, like, I mean, it's quite a vain thing to say, but like, you know, we all want to look good when you go on holiday and you're by the pool or on the beach, you know, like we don't spend much time outside here with our shirts off in the UK. So like, you know, there's something nice about um, feeling comfortable in your own skin. And I guess like there's other elements that come into it too. Like, you know, like, I, I don't really feel like, you know, I have to work my legs much. They're they're always going to be the size that they are because of the, the work that I've done through my rugby career. But I think, you know, I've got, I've got a lot of friends that train and I think like, Quite often people plateau uh, when it comes to uh, seeing gains, whether it's from a strength point of view or whether it's just looking at their body and seeing differences. Like when it comes to gaining muscle, is that the most important thing, uh, that progressive overload? Every time you go into the gym the next week, it's pushing the weight, it's pushing the reps. Is that how we get out of that plateau? I believe so. I believe it's the easiest thing that we can measure. You know, yes, you've got different types of different methods but they're, they're so much harder to track and I think with everything with anything if you're trying to progress you need to track you need to measure you know what gets managed gets measured um, so it's like when you start to really dial those things in and look at you know how we can improve on you know certain lifts and the amount of weight that we lift and the amount of reps that we do we, we can see it going the right direction. Whereas if you're just training hard and hard can, is different for everyone, you know, how are you going to measure that? Because some days are different than others. You know, you can wake up in the morning and have all the positive intentions, have a really good workout. But if you had a poor, poor night's sleep, then it might go to shit. So for me, you know, I do that with very, all of my clients. You know, I make sure that they're tracking their lifts and they're progressively overloading each week. You know, you get a good sense of achievement when you're, you know, get hitting PBs. There's more fulfillment. And sometimes it keeps you, it keeps you accountable. You know, mm -hmm. it's so easy just walk in the gym and just be there for an hour and then walk out and say, you know, I've had a good workout. You know, just getting a little sweat on it is not really progression. So if you really want a result, 
I believe that you have to progressively overload. You have to get stronger. It's helped me. And, you know, you've got, you've only got to look at, you know, the people that have built a lot of muscle. They're super strong. I'm not saying you have to be a power lifter, but if you're lifting the same weights over and over again, you can't expect to change. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get yourself and, and get yourself out of your comfort zone. And that's probably the hardest thing. It's hard. You know, going to the gym is easy. Having a hard, very tough, intense workout is hard. Yeah. So it, that's that's what I, I believe. You know, everyone's got different methods. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's more, you know, experience. And I've helped a lot of people build muscle. And that's the way they've done it. Can you build muscle doing other things? Of course you can. But it's just harder to track mm -hmm. in my eyes. Yeah, I think that's the... Um the key difference is like you know it's easy to turn up to the gym and, and lift and you know do what you've done before but to have the intention in your mind that every time you go into the gym and train chest if it's once a week you're going to take yourself to that limit or, or push yourself beyond the limit of you know that almost like you just cannot get that weight up and you're really struggling that's an uncomfortable place to go to and i yeah. think like talking about arnie watching his uh, documentary a few years ago on uh, whatever it was, Netflix, like you, you, you see that when you watch bodybuilders, you know, you've been there, you've done it, but it is a real push every session, taking yourself to another limit of pain yeah. um, and spending more time in that space. That, in my experience, is actually what creates the growth. That's the thing that is, is the magic. Like, see, when it comes to um, biceps, you know, you obviously spent a bit of time over the years working on biceps and, and growing them. Uh, if you could summarize uh, uh, in, you know, maybe 30 seconds, a bicep session that you would do to grow your biceps as quickly as possible or in the best manner possible. Okay, so first of all, pick exercises that you enjoy. First and foremost, enjoyment is the most important thing, okay? So you don't want to be doing exercises that you don't like and you, you just don't want to push hard on. Um, and then you've got to find exercises that you can engage with. So for me, you know, single arm, you know, unilateral bicep exercise is going to be better because you can engage. And if you've got any, you know, imbalances, you know, doing not single arm is going to not help you engage on that single arm. Um, and then just being consistent with progressive overload. It's just simple as that. You know, if you started curling 10 kilo dumbbells, the goal should be to get to 20 kg dumbbells. That 10 kilo increase should show muscle if you are in a surplus and if you're eating adequate protein. That is it. Like, that is it. There is no special bicep exercises that I recommend. It's going to be down to enjoyment. It's going to be down to ones that you can engage with the muscle. So, for example, if you're doing a barbell curl, you're not always, you're going to, you're not always going to feel it on the biceps. Whereas if you do a single arm preacher curl, you might get a better connection. Just because the weight that you're lifting might be lighter, it doesn't mean it, you know, you're not going to build muscle, but progressing over time should show the muscle. Mm -hmm. nice. And that is it. Yeah, simple. And I think, um, you know, you spoke a bit about uh, diet, food, calorie counting there. Um, and obviously being in a surplus is important to, to gain a muscle. How do you go about planning what you eat in a week? Like, are you breaking down uh, the amount of calories that I guess you're burning in a day? and then making a plan as to how much you're eating that day. What's your like strategy, I guess, personally? And then what would you recommend that people do when it comes to themselves, working with them as a coach? So again, I like things very, very simple. So we want to focus on how many calories we're consuming across the week. Okay, daily is important, but realistically, there's going to be days where we overeat and there's going to be days that we have to balance that out and under eat. So for example, if you're... If you had to work out, you needed 2,000 calories per day to be in a calorie deficit, you've, you've got 14,000 calories for the week. And you can balance that out however way you want to. You can have a higher day on a Saturday. It doesn't matter. And then your output. So I'm not one for looking at your you know, total daily energy expenditure because that can vary and it's just too complicated for most people. So you want to be looking at how many weight training sessions you're doing per week and get consistent with that. It might be free. How much cardio you're doing per week? And that's going to be active calories. Okay, so you want to get clear on that. You don't want to be doing 30 minutes or an hour. You want to be doing how, how much active calories you're doing because it's more accurate. So say you're doing 500 calories per week. You, know, you could break that down to two lots of 250 per week. And then you've got your steps. 
So your steps is just going to show how active you are throughout the day. You know, it doesn't have to be 10,000, but just get a number that you can be consistent with. And that's it. Once you've tracked those measurements, you've got your output, which is your steps, cardio and weight training sessions. And you've got your input, which is your calorie intake. You've got to get that to a point where you're in that deficit, maybe dropping one to two pounds per week. Hmm. But that data there that you've collected has got to be consistent. If that's up and down, you know, one week you're doing 1,000 calories cardio that, and another week you're doing one training session and you're eating 1,800 calories. This is where it gets confusing for people because the weight is up and down and fluctuating and they're not sure what to do. So data is important, but not to a point where it's overwhelming and overcomplicated. You know, your weight training is not, people say that weight training is for burning fat, you know. I do believe your weight training is just to build the muscle, retain the muscle, build strength. Focus on your nutrition and cardio and steps for the fat burning. And then just try to keep them separate. Once you've tracked that data for the week, you see what's gone on in terms of how the weight is dropped or gained. And then you make a change based on that. That's the method that I use. That's the method that's helped hundreds of people. And it's the easiest method, I believe, you know, because... When we don't track data like our steps or our cardio output, it can be a difference in like one to two pound per week weight drop. And the same with food. You know, you can eat all the healthy food you want, but if you're consuming 2,500 calories per week, you, you might not drop weight. So just get super simple with those data points. Track them consistently for, you know, two three, four weeks, and then you can start to see how it's going, and then you just make adjustments based on that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like, in terms of actually how we measure, um, or not measure, like, or track that data in terms of, like, um, you know, the food, the calories, but also then, you know, the, the calories that we're burning through exercise, like, are there best practices there? You know, like, is it, I've noticed in my own life, like, the things that I don't do at the moment, right? So I don't have a food weighing thing. I don't. I don't have a scale that I weigh my food on. Yeah, so yeah. That I tend to be a bit less accurate with measuring. You know, it's a bit of a rough guess rather than a weigh. Um, you know, when I'm at the gym, you know, I'm maybe doing like a, a you know, a Metcon type session, hit session, and I know roughly that I'm burning 700 calories, but it could be 850 or 550. Like who knows? So in terms of actually getting that data, what are the best practices that you've seen? Is it using a smartwatch? Is it actually buying a food scale? So I would always say, you know, when you're trying to track your food and it's hard, you know, you haven't got a food scale or you're out at a restaurant, you've just always got to overestimate and guess. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like, rather than getting overwhelmed and having that all or nothing mentality where it's like, oh, I don't know how much I'm eating, so I'm not going to bother at all. You're just not holding yourself accountable. It's so easy just to overeat by doing that. And use the excuse that, oh, you know, I don't want to be using an app for the rest of my life. You don't have to. It's just dialing it in. It's just getting a bit more accurate. And of course, even if you're tracking and scanning food labels, you're still not going to know 100%. But at least you're trying. At least, And then when you kind of get that data that you've potentially guessed, so say you're just eyeballing it, and then you can change it based on learning from that. You know, because it really comes down to portion control. Most of us is just over consuming calories without knowing. But the people, this is what I found, the people that are getting in shape and they say you don't have to count calories are just outworking the amount of calories they're consuming. But mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're doing too much activity, which could cause muscle loss. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you can outwork an average diet. You know, I like to say, you know, you cannot outwork an average diet. But not everyone is that active. So the people that eyeball it and intuitively eat and are not as active are going to get lost and think, well, oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm eating healthy, but you're not, you're probably overestimate, uh, underestimating how much you're eating. Mm. So if you can't weigh your food, if you don't know the calories, you have to still guess and put it down and use that food diary as accountability. You know, just guess it, 600 calories, 700 calories, whatever it is. And then you roughly know how much you've had for the day. 
And you can weigh yourself the next day. And I know there's different variables for, for the fluctuations. But if you've gained two pounds the following day, you're more than likely overeaten. So you've <laughs> underestimated. You know, people just complicate it. Keep it simple. But you have to just, you do have to be aware of your calorie intake. Otherwise, you're just going to get lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the big killers that you'll know uh, here in the UK, we love booze, right? You know, like people love going for a drink, especially can be difficult through, through the winter months, you know, like when it's dark and, you know, everyone's stuck inside and, you know, just sitting on the sofa and having a beer can be quite a, you know, it's a very regular thing that's done here. I guess, like, my question to you is, like, how, how big a part in your life has booze played? Um, and in terms of actually managing uh, our intake of that, how important is that to, to you know, the, the shape and the goals that we have? So with alcohol itself, you know, I won't get into too much about, you know, the negative impact of it in terms of, you know, the toxicity and stuff like that. But in terms of like overall, um, you know, calories, you can treat alcohol like food. Okay. So like you have a beer, 250 calories, the same as food. You know, if you look at it in that, in that way, but there's other things that it will affect. So it'll affect your mood, which will make you feel crap, which will make you want to have more alcohol or want to you to have food to get that dopamine hit you know you're going to feel sluggish sometimes you might have a hangover you might feel crap so we, that's going to lead to you not wanting to exercise so that's the effect the negative effects that it can have on that perspective in terms of like calories then yeah like i'm all for people to drink alcohol if they factor it in with their calories but they have to be aware of the other downsides that it can possibly have and we know what it's like, you know, at the weekend, if you have a few drinks on a Saturday night and, you know, that can lead to wanting to eat, overeat. And then the next day you feel a bit rough and you want to have that fry up. And then you've started the day off rubbish because you've had that fry up. So you want to have a cheat meal in the evening. So that's the, I think, the, the bigger downsides than just actually having the alcohol. So mm. it's just awareness, awareness of, and this is where I talk about nutrition a lot, that. You know, when we're eating processed foods, it's not necessarily the processed food, the calories that you're consuming. It's more about how it makes you feel and how it makes you, you know, do other things, you know, be lazy and not get that workout in or want to eat more. You know, I'm, I don't demonize foods. You know, I'm all for balance. I am. I really am because it's realistic for most people. But just be aware that when you have that alcoholic drink or that pizza, how is it going to make you feel the next day and how is that? going to ruin the next couple of days yeah it's a massive thing isn't it like you know, when i think back to i'm now a nine months out of rugby completely so like you know obviously played for a long time and then coached for professionally for a bit of time as well but i have noticed that since leaving the game um you know i guess when, when you're in a sport environment especially like rugby and it's very traditional you know there's beers in the changing room after the game it's what you do you work hard during the week you get the win you have a beer and sometimes you know it can be five or six sometimes it can be one sometimes it can be 12 you know <laughs> like and you know it's mad to think that that is professional sport like you would think it would be a lot more disciplined than that Ru rugby's not like that rugby stayed traditional maybe at the highest level it has changed maybe six nations you know england scotland yeah, during yeah. those big moments there's not as much of that happening although there probably is like one beer but i have noticed that since stepping out of the game my alcohol intake has reduced massively um and i certainly feel the difference for doing that and the biggest thing for me was like you say it's the well if you have the drink how does that um how do the implications of that unfold over the next 24 yeah. hours well it's actually just the you know, it's the, oh, just have something else now. You know, I'll start fresh again the next day. So you end up yeah. having like two days of eating shit, toxic foods, um, you know, things that, not not looking at what you're eating at all, just fucking going for it. So like, yeah, there's that definitely... Short -term, short -term gratification, isn't it? It's like... It is that. In yeah. the moment. In the moment, we, we, we want to have it and we don't think about the long-term implications. Um, yeah. But environment plays a, a huge role, right? Environment dictates your performance. So if you're going to be putting yourself in that environment, you know, your willpower is not going to be strong, you know, unless you're one of those people that is just super, super disciplined and, and got a huge belief on, you know, not drinking alcohol or not eating this food that you're surrounding yourself with, then it's going to be very, very hard for most people. Even myself, mm -hmm. you know, I might look 
you know, my social media that I'm super disciplined and I don't eat crap food. Trust me, I've had a lot of, I've probably binged more than most people. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got to put strategies in place and put yourself in better environments to stay more consistent with your goals. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point you touched on as well. It's like, you know, a life of indulgence. Uh, you know, that's one way of receiving dopamine. You know, we eat a bit of chocolate and we feel great for whilst it's in our mouth and then afterwards it's gone. And that's instant gratification. But, you know, there is another way of uh, the system operating. It's the same way, but it's essentially setting a goal, achieving a goal. And when we do the hard things that take us towards what it is that we want, we get that release of dopamine. And it's another way of living life. And I think it's the way of of, of living life uh, that actually allows us to grow, takes us to a different place um, and that type of thing. So it's just understanding that dynamic of instant gratification versus the other way of using the system. And I think like when it comes to like losing weight, when it comes to getting in better shape, when it comes to actually wanting to achieve anything, we really have to understand that. And I'm sure... You see that continuously again and again when working with clients. It's actually instilling that um, awareness of that dynamic. I think it really comes down to the priorities. You know, I talk mm -hmm. about that a lot in my coaching. You know, some people are just not aware of their priorities and what they value mm -hmm. and they're contradicting. So, for example, like someone wants to get in shape, and um, but they're very, very social. That's a conflicting value. Because mm. you're putting yourself in those environments where there's a lot of drink, a lot of bad food, but you want to get in shape as well. So unfortunately, you can't always have both or it's very, very hard. So you have to start to change your priorities. So some people feel like they want something, but they actually don't because they're not demonstrating it. If you're demonstrating progression and consistency with this specific goal, then, you know, yes, you might need different strategies and accountability to get there. But if you're not demonstrating it at all, then it's probably not right for you right now. It's mm -hmm. not high on your values. You know, you sit here, hear so many people say that, oh, you can't tell a client that they don't want it bad enough. But that is the truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes that's the truth that if you're not making progress, you don't want it bad enough right now. Mm -hmm. So it just means that you might have to focus on that in a different part of your life. No, that's okay. You've got business to worry about right now. You've got family to worry about right now. You can worry, worry about your physique another time, but you've got to be more committed and put it as a priority because if you just keep banging your head against the wall, it's not the plan. It's you're not prioritizing it right now, hmm. which is totally fine. Yeah. What What do you think? Like, I guess you know, you work with people when it comes to mindset and also um, diet, training, all all these things. A real all encompassing holistic view of like how to how to create change and get healthier. But what do you think about this notion that I guess all all change comes from darkness? Um, and I guess what I mean by that is that like you touched on, you don't want it enough. That's the issue. That is really the, the crux of why you're not able to stay committed to what it is that you want to do. It's because the pain of 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 wanting to change hasn't got big enough. I've realized in my own life, like, you know, at times, uh, you know, I, I started a business, uh, co-founded a business back you know years ago. And I guess when doing that, spent three to six months really sort of like pursuing that hard and, and removing myself from certain situations and social circles that were not going to be uh, conducive to, to to going in a helpful direction with that. And then I guess at other times in my life, you know, I've taken myself out of certain scenarios that I know are not going to be good for, you know, gaining, uh, losing weight or getting healthier or focusing in on my rugby. Um, and, I, and I think those points in my life were essential to actually making the progress and I noticed that every time that I've done that I've had success in doing whatever it was that I wanted to achieve and I yeah. think that was stemmed from just a real desperation that I wanted to to change I wanted to do something there was a desperation there was a bit of a darkness behind either maybe not feeling enough or knowing that I could be more and I think yeah. that notion comes from a bit more of a, almost like a darker place it's not like a happy yeah. place it's a I want to be more place what do you think about that? Like, you know, I think a lot of people struggle because they're seeing more advantages by not doing what they want to do. 
So food, for example, there's more, they see more advantages by eating that food than, than disadvantages. And they don't see the advantages in improving their physique. So I think it really comes down to a perception. And, and, and unfortunately, we've got a lot of baggage and things that are holding us back that are in the subconscious mind. So sometimes mm -hmm. we're not even aware of the reasons why we're doing certain things. So, you know, reflection, self-reflection -re and asking yourself the right questions is so important if you feel like you're not doing what you think you should be doing. Mm. And then it's linking the importance of this goal that you think that you should be achieving to what's more important to you right now. So, for example, if you're trying to build a business, but you're trying to get in shape at the same time, but you can feel that the business is kind of doing better, but you getting in shape isn't, you have to link the importance of getting in shape to your business you have to really see that if you get in shape it's going to help your business when you link that it should be easier to get in shape but unfortunately people don't they, they, they keep them separate and that's okay but if you want to do both you have to link them so you know yes a lot of the um the reasons why we want to achieve certain things are through voids so from personal experience now if i had low self-esteem when i was younger and i didn't feel recognized and i didn't feel worthy or didn't feel people were giving me respect i'm going to build a physique where people give me respect i'm going to build um a business where people look up to me so a lot of the things that we want in life are through voids that we didn't have you know in the subconscious and stuff like that so it's all about perceptions and where awareness and unfortunately we live in a world where we don't even have time to think it's go, go, go. It's social media. It's Netflix. It's all these stuff that's just, you know, blocking us from actually thinking about why we are not doing certain things that we should be doing mm -hmm. and actually getting super, super clear on what is it we want and who we want to become. Mm -hmm. And I know this sounds a little bit cheesy, but I think you mentioned this when we had a chat. Um, it really is about the journey. It really is about the person you become when you're trying to achieve these things. Because when I won my British titles, did that make me feel any different? You know, when I won them the next day, not really. And you will hear people, you know, when they win, make their first million pounds, like the next day, they're just normal still. It's the person that you've become along the way, not necessarily the achievement. Mm -hmm. And again, when you start to think about it that way, you start to think, okay, the process is important. Let's not, if you're one of these people, it is constantly hating going to the gym and eating the way you should be then you know it's really not important to you right now that's okay you're just putting other things in like that more priority you know not everyone has to be in shape we're not meant to be the same we're not all meant to be in shape unless there's health implications but it's awareness and it's perceptions and that takes time you know for me you know over the last 10 years is where I've really seen growth. And that's because I've worked on myself, my self-development and mindset. Mm -hmm. Getting in shape isn't about the bright training plans or diet plans. It's really about mindset. So it's kind of what I do with, with my social media. I'm showing these stuff that, that's important. You know, nutrition, training, it's important. Mm -hmm. But when I get a client into the program, I work on their mindset. I work on their beliefs, their barriers, their habits. That's what really gets someone a transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could not agree more. Um, you know, that, and that's really the crux of why I run this podcast. It's really to to delve into that idea of you know how is it that we get better? Like, what is it that creates change? Like, how can we live the life that we want to live where we can impact people? That's really the crux of you know I guess what I'm interested in. And yeah. I, and I think you know what you said there about the subconscious mind. It is all about perception. It's about you know I think back to you know you you probably relate to this you know when you were 18 20 maybe even like 22 you know the things that you just were not aware of that were driving yeah. and dictating all these behaviors in your life that you know when you then became aware of and it probably you first became aware of it there was probably a period of two or three years to really before I guess like there was an understanding period that took place and it took time before you got to a point where you you really got an understanding around what that belief was doing and how it was shaping how how you were behaving and there's so many examples in my life and that's again why we go on the journey that's what life i think is all about it's about go being able to learn and go on that journey so that we can uh it's not about achieving things but it's about it's about the journey it's about the person that you can become through 
those experiences of bringing that subconscious stuff up to the fore yeah. uh, that we can learn from. And then I think educate the next people or the people that want to go on that path. That's like, for me, that's like a good life. That, that's a, a meaningful, good life. And I think that's what you're trying to do. It seems 100%, like that. 100%. It's all about growth. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe, you know, I'm trying to become the best version of myself to give him away. Mm -hmm. So that's becoming a strong, fit, mentally strong, you know, um, healthy, intelligent, you know, just understanding all these positive traits that you can build to help someone else with. Mm -hmm. it's, it, of course, you know, you get the, the, the personal satisfaction of you seeing yourself grow, but mm -hmm. I think the secret to living is giving. So you kind of become the best version of yourself to then give them away and inspire others. And I'm not going to stop on this journey, you know, that I'm doing right now with my social media because I'm reaching more people. As much as I'm getting a lot of hate, it's, it would be easy for me to just go back to my old content and just mm -hmm. do my videos and my training and stuff like that. But this is reaching more people. If I can reach more people, then I can help more people. Mm -hmm. regardless of the hate that I'm getting. Um, so yeah, like you said, it's all about growth. It's all about pers like personal development um, and just working this out as we go. It's like mm -hmm. there's no plan for the future, although we might want to plan. We don't know what's going to turn up. We don't know what opportunities are going to come along. We don't know the challenges that are going to come along. But if we are arming ourselves with the right mindset, and the ability to pivot and not overreact and have a different perspective, then the journey is much, not easier. I don't want to say it's easier because the journey is not meant to be easy. Mm -hmm. It's more fulfilling. That's yeah. what it comes down to. It's the fulfillment of what you're achieving. Yeah. It is that. It's just the understanding that, you know, the learnings that you are going through, although they may be challenging, will at some point probably be able to be rewarding for you because then you can give that back and you can help like it's actually that's a meaningful thing contributing to humanity in a in an important way so i'm uh, i'm on the same boat like i've got a few more questions just around some uh, nutrition dietary stuff and then i want to like delve um more into sort of like the mind and then some of the social media stuff you've been doing too but what's your what are your thoughts on like fasting is it something that you do what type of fasting? So obviously you've got like your intermittent fasting and you've got your prolonged fasting. So back in the day Both. as a bodybuilder, I would, if you talked about fasting to me, I'd, I'd say you're crazy. You're a loony because your typical bodybuilder, six meals a day, chicken, broccoli, rice. I can remember it very, very clearly when someone said to me, are you going to be eating like this forever? And I said, yeah, like this is healthy. I'm going to be eating six meals a day forever. And it's just crazy how you change. But for me, you know, I've, I've realized that it really comes down to, you know, personal preference. You know, that's going to be the biggest driver when it comes to getting results. It's not about being perfect. So fasting, intermittent fasting, is just a great tool to use for people that are super busy and that allows them to have more food in a shorter space of time. So this theory, well, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to bash eating breakfast. Um, breakfast is fine. You know, you can have breakfast. It really comes down to what fits you, like it really does. So intermittent fasting, do I believe that it's a more superior way of losing body fat? No. You're just creating a smaller window of eating. If you like big meals, you get to have one or two, three big meals in a short space of time. Most people eat the majority of your calories in the evening. So if you're eating 800 calories for breakfast, it doesn't leave you much for the rest of the day. And then you've got prolonged fasting where you're looking at more health benefits you're looking at autophagy and you're looking at you know prolonged life and that type of stuff which you know i'm not an expert on i'm not going to turn around and say i know everything about prolonged i've done some research and i've tried it myself and there's benefits you know there's there's certain benefits but it's not for everyone i think the biggest benefit of a prolonged fast which you is going to be around 36 hours plus so like a full day of not eating and then you eat the following day is the, the mental clarity that you get because it, obviously you know we're we're eating every single day multiple times per day we're not letting our body rest and digest uh, we're, we're just always trying to digest so if we kind of 
letting our cells reproduce in a good way with fasting, then there's surely got to be some really good positive health benefits. But mentally, reframing from eating is a challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're so used to eating when we're bored, trying to get that dopamine hit. So if you've never tried it, try it just for that alone, regardless of the health benefits that you get, whether you believe it or not. Um, because you know you'll get people say you do a seven day water fast and it extends your life by 10 years you know some extreme stuff or you know it reduces cancer all these things that we don't really know you know we just don't know but people believe it and do it anyway but if you are that person that wants these short-term gratifications do it for the mental challenge Mm. because afterwards if you refrain from eating a full day you feel like wow that challenge that i've overcome of just not putting that food in my mouth gives you a you know a sense of achievement and confidence in yourself and and especially if you're someone struggling with mental health you know what better way to kind of show that you're tough and and, and not eating which we want to do when you get that hunger and you just want to go to the fridge don't eat stay mentally strong so for me you know prolonged fasting i've got videos on my youtube about it i've done it for the mental challenge i've done um, six days of just water and I had some coffee as well so no food and yeah it was it was you know you get a little bit of fat loss as well I'm not gonna lie that's a benefit you drop like <laughs> 10, 10 to 12 pounds yes yeah, yeah. you could lose a little bit of muscle but that's the sacrifice you make so you know fasting it, it's not for everyone there's different reasons for doing it but find out the reasons that you want to do it for that's what it's mm. going to come down to nice um, you've you'll have experimented over the years with all sorts of different foods, but um, what foods do you believe are best for us based on your experience? So the food thing is so complex; it really is, especially with you know the day and age that we live in, where you know there's so many different opinions and there's so many different influences saying eat this, don't eat this, eat this, this is bad for you. I know this is just so cliche and and so like generic, but you've got to find out what works for you. You've got to find out how you feel. And this is what people find hard. They find it hard to know how they feel. But if you're someone that has been eating, you know, highly processed foods, junk food for a while, as soon as you start cutting that out and eating single ingredient foods, you know, just one ingredient, and you've got your fruit, you've got your meat, you've got your healthy fats, do that for a couple of weeks. You will see a massive change. You will feel incredible. So it's really about understanding that processed foods are going to cause inflammation in the body, which make us feel crap. But we get used to a certain feeling. So we might think, yeah, I'm okay eating the way I eat. But you could feel much better if you cut that out, if you cut the high sugar out. I'm not going to get into like, you know, sugar and, and, and the cause on the body because everyone's got different opinions. But I do believe that all of us, we should all be eating 80 to 90% of the time single ingredient foods that are not processed and there is no best foods because at the end of the day, if I say eggs are the best, someone might not be able to tolerate eggs. Mm -hmm. Someone might not like eggs. So eggs are not the best then. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. same with steak. Steak is great, you know, a lot of nutrients. But I don't like steak. Well, don't eat steak then. You're not going to lose out. Like, there's plenty mm-hmm. of other foods to eat. So it, rather than saying this is the best, this is the worst, it's more about understanding that nutrition can be simplified if you just think about if something has one ingredient, surely that's going to be better for you than something that has 10. Because those 10 ingredients are not going to be natural. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, you get people, I talk about nutrient dense a lot, you know, because nutrient dense is important to recognize. If there's more nutrients in certain foods, then that surely should be healthier for you. Mm-hmm. But even if you eat nutrient dense foods and they give you digestive issues or, you know, gut issues or they make you feel sluggish, then those nutrient dense foods are not good for you. Mm-hmm. It's trial and error. And that's what I've done over the years. I can't mm-hmm. eat certain foods that are nutritious. And other people can't. So that's why I don't necessarily say, eat this food, try this food, see Mm. how it feels, and then get feedback and then play around with it. But I also don't say, don't say, don't eat ice cream, don't eat donuts. I don't say that. I'm not one to say, don't have some enjoyment, Mm -hmm. even though I'm not saying you need donuts for enjoyment. 
but I do realize that you have to be real. Mm -hmm. And the harder part is actually having a little bit of what you like because of the dopamine. Having one donut is freaking hard. Uh, For me, it? especially. <laughs> it is, one donut is pointless. You might as well have three. Especially yeah. you get Krispy Kremes. Like, what's the point in just having one? <laughs> oh, so, no, man. I'd rather have none. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same. Honestly, I, that's the biggest struggle, isn't it? It's like trying to moderate the, the things that are addictive. Like, it's hard. Like, you know, it's if I'm going to have some chocolate, I'm having a full bar. I'm not having like one little cube. There's no chance. Yeah. So, this is one of the reasons why sometimes that all or nothing approach can work in the short term. You know, as a lifestyle, you know, you have to be real. At the end of the day, you know, Everyone's got these personalities and sometimes they're hard to change. I've always been an all or nothing person. I'm an all or nothing person in every endeavor. I wouldn't have achieved what I've achieved if I wasn't an all or nothing person. So own it. Hmm. But understand that that can be a downside when it comes to eating. So if you're an all or nothing person when it comes to food, don't have the donuts because you know as soon as you do, you will have the whole pack. Mm -hmm. Refrain from eating them for as long as you can until you get in shape. And then if you want to start introducing them and deal with the consequences of eating the whole pack and you gain two pounds, but you're like, shit, I'm starting to get out of shape. And then you'll stop eating them again. Mm. So just learn to deal with it. Mm. But if you're someone that's saying to yourself, no, I want balance. I'm going to have a bit of what I like, but it's triggering you to eat more and you're just not getting in shape. Then that's when you might have to cut it out completely. Mm. Everyone yeah. is different. It all comes down to the mindset and how you deal with certain things. There's no one fit, size fits all. Yeah, totally agree. So, you know, we speak about trial and error, you know, and I, you, you personally will have been through so much of this. Uh, to achieve the shape that you have, you, you need to have gone through it. If I was to ask you this question based on you solely, what, in your opinion, is the best food for growing muscle? So obviously, pro obviously protein is important, but like we know, we know protein dense yeah. foods. But one specific food, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so that of the two, I'm probably going to say, but I would say eggs. I would say eggs. It's it's just got so much in that one egg, in terms of nutrients, in terms of protein. Um, but again, like this is the thing: if you don't like eggs, don't feel like you're you've got to be one of those people that just chugs them down more to get it in, like. Mm -hmm. It's a bigger picture. Nothing ever narrows down to one or two things. It's always the bigger picture. So like, you know, I could put them in order of my top 20 foods mm. based on nutrients, based on bioavailability, based on protein. But if you don't like eggs, eat steak. If you don't like steak, eat beef mince. If you don't like beef mince, eat salmon. If you don't like salmon, eat chicken. Just go down the list, mm -hmm. you know, but it's going to come down to foods that are high in nutrients and foods that, you know, if we're looking at building muscle, high in protein. And if you're vegan, then uh, I can't help you're you. You're fucked. But just, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I just can't help you. Like, it is what it is. But, uh, you know, everyone's got on different journeys. Yeah. You know, and it really comes down to what works best for you. It, it just, it seems so boring when I say that. Sometimes I hate it when I say that. But the reality mm -hmm. is, anything that you want to achieve in life, it's not always going to be complicated. It is going to be simple, but it's so simple that you think it can't be that simple. Mm -hmm. And that's why they don't do it because they think it can't be that easy. Just eat less and move more. No, no, it can't be. There's, there's more to it than that. Is there a certain food? Is there a certain supplement? Is there a certain training method? Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the job of a coach to, to try to articulate it in a way that it makes sense to someone. And they yeah. follow it and they get the result and they go, ah, oh, now I know. Yeah, yeah. You've no, got to exactly. sift through all the, the BS. Yeah. You do. You really do. Um, it's not, you know, I think there's one thing, getting this information off somebody, but then it's like applying that information and learning the, the pitfalls yourself. That's what really gives you the, and that's what a, a great coach does. A great coach instills the information and hopefully can, um, highlight some of the pitfalls so that you don't need to go too far into them. You know, you just have to dip the toe in and then you come back out rather yeah. than plummeting head first into it. <laughs> Everyone's different. People want, people learn differently. People want the real science and the amount of comments I've had from people, where's your study on this? Where's your scientific research? Where's your background? Are you a doctor? I'm like, well, 
you can't even entertain these people that are not willing to learn um, mm. and just be open minded. But yeah, yeah, everyone learns differently. Some people want the the details. Some people want the basic stuff. But you know, you've got to try to do your best you can. And and for me, it's just educating the way that I believe is the right way. And then some people are not going to learn from it, and some people are. Mm. You know, it's just the way it is. That's why you've got different coaches. You know, we're all trying. Every single coach is trying to do the same thing. We're trying to help people. It's not like, I mean, yes, there's some people that are just trying to make money, of course, but deep down they're still trying to help people. Mm. But there's different methods. So when I get a, when I see a coach bashing up, bash another coach, I don't understand that. I don't get why you're trying to bash someone that's just trying to help people as well just because they've got different beliefs to you. I just, mm. I really despise when people are bashing other coaches. I've never done it. And I never will. We have different opinions. That's it. We're still trying to help other people. So why are you trying to call me out and trying to make my business go downhill? Because I'm just trying to help someone and I've got a different belief to you. Yeah. Crazy. No, that is crazy. And, you know, you see social media, Instagram, things like that now. It's almost become a thing where, you know, one coach or one professional bashes another one just to, you know, try and get more of that audience towards them because they want yeah. the business. And it's like, you know, uh, I, I'm not somebody who believes in that either. I've never, you know, sometimes we can feel the urge to want to say something to somebody that might be negative or, you know, might uncover a mistruth that they're talking about. But in, in actual fact, what is that going to do? It's not going to do anything. It's not truly, something that yeah, you would... If they truly believed, sorry to interrupt, if, no, they, no, if they truly believe that they are doing harm, then let the universe deal with it. <laughs> like, yeah. Let it... Let it unfold itself. Why do you have to get involved? Just focus on what you're doing in your message. Mm -hmm. And if your message is good enough, it sh you, your message shouldn't be about bashing someone else, regardless yeah. of, of how you feel, because that just, to me, it just shows that you're just trying to you know, build your engagement. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, everyone is different, right? Yeah. It is what it is. Uh, and I think, you know, like the funny thing is, is that is how some people blow up on social media because of, you know, a rogue comment or some sort of like um, thing that's been said or or just like a viral video slagging someone or something like that. Like that happens. But in, in your case, like you, your, your profile has grown massively. And again, I said at the start of the episode, the reason that I came across you was because you were on my explore page. You know, I was just flicking through and seeing you eating a steak off that big bloody wooden platter thing that you <laughs> eat off. And, uh, you know, obviously I got interested in it because it's, it's what I like to do as well. Um, so, like, was there specific things that you did uh, around uh, making videos or content that really sort of, like, uh, sprung board you into into growth? Was it one specific video? Was it What was it? So what it was is I've been eating off a chopping board for uh, about a year and a half. You know, I'm not saying I've been eating like this forever. And I've been eating like this style of eating. You could say it's a style. I'm not saying it's a diet. The mm -hmm. style of eating is more meat, more kind of animal-based type products, more um, like one to two free meal style meal frequency for around three to four years. Not forever. I used to be a bodybuilder. But around three to four years, I've been generally eating this way. Mm -hmm. But I realized that I've always been someone that's very find it very hard to share what I'm doing because it might rub people up the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So deep down for me, I didn't want to get hate. I knew people wouldn't like the thing that I was doing, but I thought to myself, I'm doing a disservice to the people that actually want to see what I'm doing mm -hmm. and will get benefit. So I thought, you know, stuff this, I'm just going to go for it. I had my top off my first video because I thought to myself, well, I've not got a bad physique. I wasn't really lean. I get a lot of, get a lot of comments about, it. you're not even lean. Um, <laughs> but I'm a natural athlete, right? Why am I not going to promote myself? I've never taken steroids. I'm proud of my body. I'm proud of the hard work that I've put in. That's going to inspire some people. It's also not going to inspire some people. So I had my top off. I've got my chopping board out because you can show the food better, you know, and I do eat on a chopping board not all the time i do eat on a plate as well i have got plates i have got t-shirts um and i've done that first video not even thinking about oh this is going to go viral or this is 
But I knew that it would get a bit of attention because it was strange. I didn't even think about what I was going to do. I just it, The first video was eggs and prawns and a bit of fruit. You know, and it's like, yeah, that just took off. And I was like, right, I'm doing this more because of the engagement and the attention. If I can attract more people to my page, it's more people that I can help. You know, am I doing it for views and likes? Of course I'm doing it for views and likes because views and likes builds engagement, which helps me build my client base. I mean, you'd be silly to not think that I'm doing it for views and likes. Mm -hmm. I mean, do views and likes give you clients? Not necessarily, but it's my job to teach, educate, and give value to a person that they think, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. This guy gets results. I'm going to hire him as a coach. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to get tons of clients straight away because personally, I don't want people that don't know me. I don't want people just jumping into my page and going, oh, this guy looks good. I'm going to ask him for coaching because they don't even know my personality. Mm -hmm. I'd rather them watch some of my YouTube videos. I'd rather them follow me for a couple of months before they go, right, this is the coach for me because mm -hmm. I don't work with everyone. So mm -hmm. it just took off from knowing that, you know, there's a lot of engagement here and there's a lot of people that are DM me saying, you know, eating this way is helping me. Even though it's just a normal way of eating, it's not, I'm not carnivore. I'm not animal based. I'm not keto. I'm just eating single ingredient foods, but I'm doing it in a fashion that's making you think I'm extreme because I've got my top off, because that's inspiring some people. And I've got using a chopping board, which looks not normal, but I fit more food on the plate, uh, on the chopping board. It looks better. When your food looks better, it's more appetizing. You want to eat it like there's, there's science behind that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's that. And now I'm going to keep pushing it. And now I have to be a bit more creative because I don't just want to, sh I'm not trying, my message is not eat the way I'm eating. My message is always eat good quality foods and track your calories. Mm -hmm. Like you have to read my captions as well because the captions are like, this is X amount of calories that works for me. Find out how many calories you need. Eat the foods like this that work for you and you should get results. Rather than the people that are saying, just eat healthy foods, but you don't need to track your calories and you'll be lost in two months time when you've dropped a ton of weight super fast and you've plateaued because you drop your calories too low. That's not mm -hmm. helping anyone. You're mm -hmm. just telling people to eat healthy and they already know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, to put it into like a, an everyday context, like you look at a business, let's just say a business that, hell, that sells a, a health supplement, they use social media to promote what they're selling and that's how they sell. Like yeah. you are the product here. You're the product. You're yeah. the guy that has trained. You're the guy that's got them sell in good shape. And you've throughout your your life, you've you've had this period of trial and error when it comes to this specific thing, which is as an athlete, a bodybuilder, someone who enjoys going to the gym, someone who enjoys trying to figure out what food they should be eating to look as good and feel as good as they can. Um, that that's who you are. And and, yeah. and essentially, there is nothing wrong with putting these things on social media if you are creating value. Uh, for people that that's my you know view on this so i think the people that you know get jealous or you know don't really understand that uh I, I think it does come from a jealous place like that's it it's like you know if you look at somebody who's doing something that you want and you uh, see that they're having success and you hate on them then you need to i think have a think about the way that you're viewing life from from that perspective so um i think that I think it's been great. I think your content's brilliant. Honestly, it's been really informative. Uh, I have started to think about things differently in terms of calorie intake uh, and what I'm doing in terms of my food intake. I'm training hard. You know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things that um, are showing me progress, but there's definitely things that you have touched on and mentioned that have shown me a lot of value. So I think, you know, uh, just from me to you, it's brilliant that you're putting this stuff out Appreciate there. So, so, so thank you for that. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, like, it's, it's, listen, it's been absolutely brilliant to have you on. Um, you know, I think it's been a really valuable episode and, you know, we've covered so much uh, from, from mind to body to food and all sorts. So uh, for, for people that have listened to this, I, ho I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, Sam, really appreciate you coming on and having a chat. Uh, thank you for having me. I think the message that I wanted to get across is that, one, you know, we all know that we can be doing better with our health and fitness. Okay, we've got to be honest with ourselves. 
Instead mm-hmm. of trying to justify and make excuses, be honest with yourself. Brutally honest. You kind of know what you should be doing. Don't look for something secret or magic pill because it's not out there. Do the basics but do them well. And if you do struggle with doing the basics well, you have to work on your mindset. You have to work on why is it that I can't do this? Why can't I adhere to something that's quite simple? And then when you get deeper into that, then you're going to find out there's certain things in the subconscious that could be holding you back. Or, you know, that goal is just not important to you right now and reflect. And maybe you look at it in a couple of years time and you've got more commitment to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great message. And uh, it's a process, an ever evolving process. And, uh, you know, thank you for, for shedding some light on that today. So, uh, yeah, listen, man, appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll have another chat soon. Thank you, mate.